Okay, good day, everybody. Hi, hello from IEEE, and thank you for joining us. Um, today, we are doing our last webinar in the series of um, webinars uh, linked to our Children's Data Governance Applied Case Studies project, where we conducted a call for case studies to uh, organizations that are developing products and services uh, for ch children uh, in a manner that is, um, you know, respecting of children's data and is uh, empowering underserved community. That is the um, the the focus that we have uh, on today's session. Uh, we have several uh, representatives here who will be presenting their case studies uh, with a focus on education and skills building for underserved communities. And we are very excited to hear from them in just a few minutes. Before we do that, just a few points I wanted to make everybody aware of. Uh, we will have uh, the attendees muted. Um, we are broadcasting and also recording the session. Uh, if you have any technical issues, please use the chat feature and my colleague Christina will try to assist. Uh, if you have questions for our speakers, uh, we also have the Q&A feature enabled and we would ask that you submit them there and we will be happy to uh, address them as we go. So, uh, we do look forward to your engagement and uh, your questions or comments. Uh, on, on the session today. Uh, as I part of our applied case studies on children's data governance work, IEEE launched this uh, with the goal of building upon existing work in this space to ensure that uh, principles for uh, protecting and empowering children online, for treating their data respectfully and for giving them agency uh, are put into practice. And to that end, we are looking to create a collection of, of, of case studies uh, that show how this can be done, that shows how uh, companies are thinking about delivering services to children uh, that meet uh, the needs of children and that are also child respecting and age appropriate and uh, pri privacy preserving. So it's really important in these to highlight the human centered approach uh, to, to, do, uh, to develop uh, these services and products. Uh, and with that, you know, we also think that these can serve as the foundation for future space. Uh, there already are some standards uh, that organizations are following, but there are also, uh, and standards are a great way that will help scale best practices um, and make them more usable by, by uh, everybody. So we hope that the case studies that we are sharing today and also the reports more broadly show good examples and inspire people uh, to, to also consider and implement some of these important principles, the children and their families um, better and, and address, uh, serve them in a very you know, uh, inclusive manner. So you can download the report here, uh, but I think first we wanna hear about all the case studies uh, and then we can discuss from there, see what questions we get, and also have a discussion amongst the panelists and uh, the audience. So we look forward to hearing uh, from everybody. So today, as I said, our focus is on serving underserved communities with education and uh, skills building. And we have three case studies that we'll be hearing about. Those phone casts with kids and Digital Nation Africa. And uh, we will be excited to hear those three case studies and then discuss common themes, common challenges, and any other questions that will come up. So with that, I will pause and I will ask Sinduja to uh, start with the first uh, case study. And so we're excited to hear about the dosed phone casts.
So Sinduja, um, if you want to come off mute and uh, display. Yeah, thanks, Marta. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Thank you, yeah. Hello everyone, this is Sinduja here from Dost Education. Um, so a little bit about Dost before we go into the IEEE data principles and how we use them. So we are an education nonprofit organization and our vision is every child irrespective of where they are born uh, enter school ready and are able to get the best education possible. Um, the way we do that is we give parents of any literacy level tools to take charge of their child's early development and lifelong learning. And the reason to start this early is there's so much research behind how 90% of the child's brain development happens before they turn six. And it's very important to provide them with the best learning experiences at that time. So children enter school prepared and do not fall behind compared to their well their peers. You might be wondering why we started focusing on this specific issue. So there is this really jarring statistics that came out in 2016, which said half of Indian fifth graders can't read a second grade textbook in their native language. And this has been attributed to several causes, but one of the important pieces is that children end up behind when they start school. And the only way to change that is by providing the best early learning experiences uh, by the time they enter school. And we know there are um, parents who are extremely motivated to provide the best opportunities for their children. And there are 150 million such parents just in India who are looking for resources to make change the problem that exists. And that's exactly where we come in. Um, it all requires simple processes, I mean, simple activities like talking to the child, singing to the child, and playing with a three to four year old to make sure they have these learning experiences at home. So it's not rocket science, but imagine if you're a parent who lives in rural parts of India, hasn't gone to school themselves, and haven't had these experiences growing up, it might be really difficult to even imagine how to start doing this and um, how, how to provide these experiences and also to be sure if you're doing the right thing for your child. So that's where we um, come in to support parents. So those, uh, in many languages, it means friend. So we serve as a parent's friend that calls them every day using a simple phone call. And we provide one to two minute recorded audio messages on parenting tips and early learning activities. So all parents need is a simple phone like the one you see on this picture here. They dial our number and they get started on our program. So we build awareness in communities. We go door to door to the parents, build awareness of the importance of their role in child's development. Parents sign up by just dialing our number and four times a week, they start receiving one minute audio messages on their phone. So through these messages, they learn home routines, behavior tips to just give you an idea of what these activities look like. Imagine a mother has a, a family has a two-year-old and they're making dinner at home and in especially in the northern parts of India like making rotis the Indian breads is an everyday affair and we have an activity that goes about how you can teach the concept of big and small to a two-year-old by making rotis of different sizes. Um, so it's a very simple tweak to a parent's everyday routine, but which makes it very important to teach a pre-numeracy concept to a two-year-old, which builds on the foundation of when they enter school. These are, and brain-boosting interactions, help children start school with confidence. So most of our users, like I mentioned, are low-income caregivers in the rural parts of India. And we work with some of the state governments and also with UNICEF to reach out to these families. And we're reaching out to more and more families, especially during the pandemic. Um, as more kids are home, they don't have preschools to go to. 
and parents need all the more support during this time. So now in this context, um, how do we use different um, like data principles or human-centered principles? So I would like to highlight two main principles. One is data agency. And as you can see here um, from this picture, um, they, I mean, we see a health worker or in the community explaining about the program to the parent, building awareness and helping them sign up. And what we make sure uh, happens here is the parent is fully aware of their choices and what they are opting for at the time of registration. So we have a two-step process which asks for explicit user consent. So we mandatorily require the parent to voluntarily dial our phone number um, from their phone at which they want to receive a one for a parent to express consent that they're going to sign up for the program. And step two um, is where they receive a call back from us, an automatic phone call where they survey to express that they can opt into the program and without any of the we do not get them started on the program so we it's absolutely important for us to make sure parents have informed choice that they make at the time of signing up for this program um, so this was a very i mean this was something that we had to build over time over many years of what it really means to have data agency for a parent um, in terms of the environment that we work that we work in and also the simple technology that that we use to reach families so i want to highlight the next one which is well being this was an interesting one for us because uh, since the time we started in 2015 we've always been thinking about how do we use human centered principles and user centered principles into building. and there i mean for us well being is Parents, even though they might they might be coming from an under-resourced background, they have fun, they feel supported, and are completely confident in themselves and their culture as they are going through this journey of um, learning how to better support their children. We do not ever want them to feel inadequate in this process. And the way we do this is by making sure our content is locally relevant, imbibes like look and also making sure it it has elements of empathy in it and completely um acknowledges um the difficult role that they are playing so i want to highlight just one specific piece that stood out to us during the pandemic um so this was in march of 2020 when the whole country went on lockdown India, and where um, many of you must have seen pictures um, or read news articles about uh, low-income migrants were just traveling on foot from urban areas to rural areas, and a lot of those users are the ones that we target. So in terms of school readiness and supporting children and helping families provide a great environment for kids, the whole story changed, and we wanted to know what was really important for parents and families uh, to make them feel supported at that time. So within a span of two weeks, we did 300 interviews with parents to understand the immediate need of these families during the pandemic. Uh, one of the things that we kept hearing over and over again, obviously apart from having access to government programs, was the insurmountable stress that these families were going through. No one had any, um, like no one could play, think about education in the uh, midst of all that was happening during the pandemic. So that really um, motivated us to build a mental well being and resilience well being program uh, for families. And we reached out to about 60,000 families um, within a span of five months in the last year uh, using these services. So people who receive this program are. Um, were migrant workers who had moved from Delhi to remote areas in the neighboring states. And this was the only uh, media resource or credible information that they had access to. 
Um, so we've, we're proud to have supported um, these families and really it was a great experience also to understand how we could respond to the immediate needs of what was happening. Yeah. Thank you, that's from my side. Moira, back to you if there are any questions. Thank you, Sinduja. Thank you very much for the presentation. And I think one, one of the things I find exciting about this is also, you know, we think about children, uh, but also families and parents, I think, need to be supported as well. Uh, and so we were happy to have uh, a case study that has uh, that focus as well. Um, so thank you for sharing that. I don't see any questions yet. Let's okay. keep going and then uh, discuss questions. Uh, at the end. So with that, um, I will bring up uh, the next presentation, which is um, for WizKids. And I will ask uh, Piril to uh, introduce herself briefly and start the presentation. Yeah. Thank you very much, Maura. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Piril, uh, and I'm Brand and Loyalty Manager in Tuxel uh, and responsible of Digital Society Solutions. Uh, brand and loyalty marketing. So Tuxel is Turkey's leading mobile operator with a variety of social innovative and digital solutions. Moira, we can start with the presentation. <laughs> with the help of Moira, I'll be presenting. Uh, yes. And I hope you are seeing my screen now. Yes, we do. Excellent. So, yeah. Um, next slide, please. So the WizKids project was launched in 2016 by Tuxel with an emphasis on the importance and the necessity of equal accessibility for technology learning. It is Tuxel's initiative under the auspices of uh, the Ministry of National Education, gifted students aged from 8 to 16 uh, from all over Turkey, but with the potential to build the future and with some gifts, you know. However, it's actually hard to define who is gifted, what is a gift, and who is not gifted, because the skills behind it are very wide and sometimes they are not very obvious. According to the researchers, approximately 2% of the population is said to be gifted regardless of race, culture, or socioeconomic status. Next, please. So discovering and educating this 2% is very important at the early ages, we accept that, which brings me to the point of the median age of Turkey. Uh, Turkey has the youngest population in Europe. It's almost 31 years old, median age. According to the world, uh, in Turkey, we have 18 millions of uh, children under 14 years old and the importance and the necessity of their continuous and multidimensional learning in today's digital world are awesome. Next, please. So what we did within this project, uh, took South first established technology laboratories for technological productivity, for channeling the maker culture in uh, uh, science and art centers of Ministry of National Education in Turkey, where particularly talented students receive post-school project-based training. So in these labs, students are introduced to robotic coding, 3D printing, robots and software equipment, as well as maths, space science, internet of things and artificial intelligence. Next, please. Uh, but uh, there was a problem, of course, because this solution was accessible to a limited number of children with limits of geography at the very same time. So if we accept 2% is gifted, only uh, almost 400,000 of the 80 million Turkish students are gifted then. So we uh, have another story here, which brought us to uh, decide uh, not to dump the rest. Next, please. And as physical laboratories were uh, limited to geography, Tuxa created this WizKids mobile application in late 2019 with more content than in class. Uh, and the mobile application is a further step to spread the technology learning 
all around Turkey without any geographical or socioeconomic limits. Children can le uh, all children can reach all content, enroll in different courses, take tests, ask questions on discussion boards, engage with real teachers via the mobile app. So the mobile application is uh, basically a free of charge, all accessible and eligible throughout the country. Next, please. And here you see the mobile application. Uh, not surprisingly, after the second month of its launch, almost two thirds of the existing students started to use it directly. And uh, many more actually started to download that. Next, please. And uh, on WizKids mobile app, students are taking a wide range of uh, courses from robotics, from coding to mobile application development, as I told before. Next, please. And um, the project emphasizes the empowerment, the empowerment of women and girls. More than half of the students enrolled in the app are girls who never had technology education from lower to middle income families. So to promote social and economic empowerment of women to contribute to their improvement of education and welfare are among the uh, objectives of this project. And next, please. So what do we address depending on IEEE's data principles? Our three principles, human rights, transparency, and data agency. Uh, we are following recommendations of convention on the rights of the child. So one example that supports how we protect the rights and best interests of children in the technology is that we value accessible, accessibility in terms of location, uh, socioeconomic status, and ability. All children in Turkey can access all content via the mobile app, thus overcoming the economic, social, and other barriers through the technology education. Transparency is also emphasized by WizKids because it is crucial for us to build trust and confidence in the technology. So we define transparency um, as explainability, as interpretability of the system. To help ensure uh, transparency, the evaluation criteria of our students' scoring is transparent, so users can understand and why they receive specific scores and decision paths. Secondly, we use open source codes for um, actually, which makes the code publicly accessible. So the open code means. Uh, it is possible for everyone uh, to reach the same result of actions when they manually perform the same operations on the platform. And data agency is also emphasized. A user can review the pol privacy policy as it's free in the application and use data subjects right to voice their questions and concerns. WizKids only gathers um, the necessary personal data and, the, and some technical information information mobile app. This way, children may use the application without losing progress, and parents can observe their children's development. Um, the first challenge we faced uh, actually is to deliver as much quality educational content as possible and to continuously deliver appropriate education to our students. Another one is a question, actually. How can we sustain and increase the impact of technology teaching Uh, this, um, we must also ensure that we expand our user base to new students and WizKids implements new methods to keep the educational content engaging and accessible. So thank you for listening. I'm leaving the floor to Moira and thank you Moira for your help for um, screen the Thank you Piril. Thank you for sharing your experiences and highlighting uh, both your focus and also some of the challenges. I know that uh, the challenges are sometimes very, and people may relate to the challenges. And so there's a lot to be learned uh, from that side as well. Um, now, um, <clears throat> I will stop sharing my screen and um, ask our final presenters to present. And we actually have two presenters on this last case study. So I welcome Fatima and Melissa uh, to please uh, go ahead and share your awesome. case study. Thank you, Maura. And thank you, everyone uh, who participated in uh, in this effort. You know, I think it was really exciting to see some of the other, um, you know, use cases and some of the other um, examples. 
Uh, my name is Melissa Sassy, and I am IBM Z's Chief Penguin. Um, yeah, I came up with my own job title and job. I had a student and entrepreneur experience globally within the IBM Z division of um, IBM. And from an IEEE perspective, I also am the, the chair of the Skills and Readiness um, Working Group, which has worked very closely with the um, standards um, group within IEEE um, to launch the world's first standard for what it means to be um, digitally literate. Happy to um, provide a link to anyone who might be interested. Um, Fatima, do you want me to share my screen or are you sharing yours? I'm trying to share it, but it's keep saying it's failing. So okay, let me see if I can. Uh, give me one second. I'll see if I can pull it up. And let me try again. Share. Okay, yeah, there we go. There we go. It's here. Awesome. Do you want to put it into presentation yes. mode? One okay, perfect. Um, so yeah, I already introduced myself. Um, you can find me at Mentor Africa with a K. Let's go back because we got to introduce you, Fatima. <laughs> Thank you so much, Melissa. You're so welcome. I'm I'm Fatima. I'm the marketing communication lead for Mia Skills Initiative. Um, and basically, uh, my job is to just get the word out there about skills initiative, uh, skills programs from IBM, so such as Digital Nation in Africa, uh, what we're going to be talking about today. I encourage people to adopt emerging technologies uh, and innovation and kind of help, um, help fuel entrepreneurship uh, in, in countries, you know. So, yeah, that's it for me. Awesome. So let's move on to the next slide then, uh, Fatima, and we can, we can jump in and, you know, wow, I think, um, you know, the world or, you know, the continent of Africa, we know that, you know, digital is an important element of um, preparing for the future of work. Um, but if we hone on what's happening, you know, on the continent specifically, you know, check out some of these stats, you know, over 230 million jobs in Africa require digital skills by 2030 and it'll outgrow any other market so it's really important for youth you know on the continent to be prepared for the future of work and that's where digital nation africa comes into play um you know many of us know that africa is the youngest continent in the world and is home to one of the fastest growing economies you know so there's so much stuff going on and ibm is really excited to be um part of that and help to empower um young people to gain access to um, the digital skills necessary as i mentioned to prepare for the future of work and we'll talk about one of those what those some of those skills are in a second uh, if you could move on to the next slide Fatima. all right over to you this one's your slide yeah, yeah so what is dna Right. So Digital Nation Africa is our is IBM's free online learning and innovation platform. Um, the idea over here is to empower the African youth with digital skills and in a way that makes it super simple for them. Right. And we want it to be um, accessed by each and every one. So it doesn't have to be somebody just studying in a college or in a university where anyway you have those resources, but uh, even in rural communities in Africa, you know, that are really hard to reach. So we want to make it accessible for everyone. Um, so basically the platform, uh, on the platform, you can gain skills on emerging technologies such as cloud, AI, blockchain, you know, all the new uh, stuff that's coming up. Um, uh, we allow people, uh, we give them access to a cloud platform, so which allows them to build their own solutions, innovate. So in a way, we're, um, you know, helping uh, entrepreneurship, uh, you know, over there. Uh, we encourage that. Of course, also for people, uh, you know, who may not have any skills, but want to gain skills for the latest jobs in the market. So we know, like, let's say there's AI analysts, data scientists, if they want to be any of that, we want to make sure that DNA helps them become just that, right? Um, so we have target, basically it's everyone. So we have entrepreneurs, SMEs, startups, universities, school students, and anybody who wants to change their lives. So all opportunity seekers out there, DNA is for them. Over to you. So, oh, you know, since this is a platform that is, you know, know also focused on youth yet available to everyone you know naturally it's important that we follow a number of different principles 
principles to ensure that you know this platform is um, both safe and secure. And so we've laddered up into um, you know three common principles or three data principles you know that um, are are relevant from an IT and also world perspective. And that's you know first off human rights. So you know education is a human right and how can we empower you know youth of the continent um, to have access to education informal education that's you know free and accessible we have a a, a wide group of uh, leaders across the continent um, from a variety of different countries who focus um, you know most of their jobs if not all of their jobs on you know bringing these skills into universities um, to students with some amazing colleagues out there that are you know, based out of, you know, Kenya or Nigeria and all over the place um, that we have an opportunity to collab with often. So in case you're looking at this thinking, wait a second, I don't know if Melissa's from the continent. I don't know if that continent. Um, we do have a, a, a wide group of people who are on our team and work with us day in and day out uh, to bring this to life and to make sure that it is a local solution that's relevant for, um, you know, local populations. So we also look at, you know, the, the well-being aspect of things. So, you know, opening up opportunities to, um, you know, control your future and provide, you know, free and easy access to economic opportunity. And then the last piece about protecting, you know, and if you think about, you know, IBM as well, you know, one of the biggest things that we focus on is data protection, privacy, and security. And, you know, as a matter of thinking about our systems business, we provide the most secure um, server on the planet. Um, and there are a lot of attributes and accolades that, you know, I could go into in another talk, but we like to see, you know, some of those same principles that we put into our technology also into the platforms that we that we launch to ensure that our customers, our users, or our participants, or our youth, you know, are also protected when it comes to their data. And in many cases, we are actually going above and beyond um, local laws, you know, especially when it comes to data protection, privacy, and security. All right, Fatima, next slide. All right, so what kind of cool stuff can you learn? Um, Fatima mentioned a few things. So you know, I know for me, I, you know, I recognize that not everybody is going to be a computer scientist, not everybody is, a, is going to be a data scientist. However, you know, our youth of the future should understand the basic building, of what it, the basic building blocks of data protection, privacy and security, the cloud, data science and analytics, and all of the different things that you can see up here. And think about this as an opportunity to dial your skills up and down, depending upon on your level, but also connect these skills to jobs. So it's not just about, hey, how do I go out and learn these things? But it's kind of also identifying that there's a number of different, let's call it hardcore technical skills that you can learn, but there are also soft skills that are included as well. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Fatima, we've got things on you know, emotional intelligence and or, you know, design thinking. I don't have the whole gamut of all the different courses that are available. You got to check it out. Um, I will tell you one of the things that guts me the most is I spend a lot of time on the continent. Um, you know, my, uh, my family lives in Tunisia in North Africa. So I spend much of my time there and I can only access to the Digital Nation Africa when I'm on the continent. So we're going to provide you with a link today. But in case you look at it and think, wait a second, this URL doesn't work. I can't get there. If I'm not mistaken, there's some challenges where it's only available to people on the continent. So I, you might have a little bit of FOMO moment uh, going on today in case you're looking to gain access, um, which obviously there are other ways to access it, but I am not going to give you directions on how to do that because I don't want to get in trouble. All right, Fatima, next slide. All right, so we have uh, an amazing story here that I really wanted to share. So this incredible young lady, um, her name is uh, Mavis. She's from Nigeria. And this is just an example of, you know, how DNA can really uh, has been changing lives on the ground, you know. Um, so she basically uh, didn't have the means to study further. Um, her family, um, you know, was a uh, they were uh, they were struggling a lot. Um, so and she was from a very non technical background anyway. Um, and she just didn't know what to do. Um, so one of her friends actually suggested that hey that you know, since you're not doing much, why don't you just uh, check out this new platform digital nation Africa, it's by IBM, and it's free. 
And, you know, so when I was interviewing her, she told me that she could not believe that this is for free, you know, like she logged in and the wide variety of courses that were there, uh, she really could not believe that every uh, this this quality of education is coming to her for free, you know. So anyway, she started learning there and, you know, like she was in incredibly um, uh, motivated to, you know, learn as many new skills as possible. So she started coding, she learned JavaScript, she learned HTML. And then she was, uh, uh, she was looking at some programs in the US and there was a university which was saying that, okay, if you submit like, you know, a few projects that we can have a look at, um, you might be eligible for a scholarship. So she applied to Brigham Young University in the US and uh, she built like a fully functional website using uh, JavaScript and HTML from what I understand. Uh, and literally uh, they loved it. They offered her full scholarship. Um, so, you know, it, it, it really was a miracle for her. I mean, for us, uh, we take a lot of things for granted, you know, education that, yeah, we're going to go to school, we're going to you know, go to university, get a job. But for a lot of people, this is just a dream. And just to see her journey and how Mavis achieved that through the platform, you know, this is what gives our work meaning. So it's for us, it's not just about uh, that yeah we have to build a platform and get our name out there but no you know our our core is about helping people and really making a difference you know so this was just a a really nice crazy story that we wanted to share with you right so as melissa said um unfortunately the platform is only accessible in africa uh, but in case you find your way around it, this is the link. Uh, or maybe may when you're in Africa, you can uh, for sure um, go to digitalnationafrica.com. And um, yeah, uh, if and of course, if you have any more questions, anything else, um, Melissa and I are always there. You can uh, please feel free to ask us. I'll put in my Twitter handle just in case anybody wants to connect further. Um... So there's my Twitter handle. Um, feel free to connect. It's Mentor Africa with a K. Um, happy to answer any questions that anyone might have. Everybody awesome. died today, Maura. <laughs> Great, and thank you both as well. And for for also, I, I think all three case studies did it, but this one, of course, with the testimonial at the end too. Right? It's about impact in the end, and about using these technologies to provide. Uh, things to provide applications that can have real life impact and make people's lives better. And I think, uh, so that was a really good note to kind of end and on uh, with the presentations and to use as a jumping off point for our discussion. I know that sometimes um, regulatory questions or other things are less exciting. Uh, impact and, and changing lives is of course what we want to discuss, but we did have a question um that went back to uh consent uh so uh let, we'll start with that uh and one of the things uh maybe before um uh i i hand it over uh to the group is the question was uh went back to the example from india uh and uh asked specifically of what type of parental consent was collected um because it's uh, about uh, data about children on general uh, activities. So uh, what is the significance of the consent in this um, context? So that's a very specific question on the consent, but I also think just we see really the data protection uh, trends, right? Obviously GDPR in Europe, but if we look around the world, I mean, many countries have laws that are either already in effect uh, you know, from South Africa to, you know, other places, like we always talk about GDPR, but it's really so many more. India um, is coming into effect and so many other places. So I think it's an important topic and uh, it affects all of your technologies in different ways. Uh, and I know, of course, when you're dealing with different jurisdictions, 
and different uh, requirements, uh, that can be a challenge. But so maybe we can elaborate a little bit on that question. Uh, so we start specifically with answering the question on the consent in, uh, in the dosed example, but then I would invite others to share their perspectives. Thank you, Myron. Uh, thanks for this question, Abdul. Uh, so just giving a little bit context on the privacy laws in India, like the first data privacy laws are in the draft policy. The bill was filed in 2019, 2020. So anyways, in terms of regulations and laws that exist, it's still up and coming. Um, so coming back to, so it means there's all the more like for organizations that want to be ethically responsible, it's all the more important for us to make sure we do have some practices in place, even if the regulation doesn't mandate it yet. Um, so in terms of parental consent, uh, so some of the data that we get access to that get comes on the platform is on for, are you able to hear me? I think all of you are frozen. We can hear you. Okay, got it. Um, so some of the areas that the like data that comes through the platform is for how long a parent stays on the phone call. So the entire system is automated and how long a parent stays on a phone call. And there are also quizzes that talk about the parents' observations of the child's development. So we are speaking of any child between the age birth to six years. So we do have questions embedded in these audio messages where we ask parents, um, quizzes, so self-assessment reports on what they see changing in the child as a result of the activities that they do with the kid. So even which is data about the child, but then reported by the parent. So the consent um, is that the parents consenting for us to store this on the platform. Um, so we can actually give it back to them through um, reports if they have access to a smartphone. But other than that, we only, we do not, uh, we for our internal analytics purposes, we only use it in an aggregate manner, but we do not um, have individualized data stored on the servers for our purposes that we internally look at. So the thing that they're consenting to is for parents to get back access to their own data uh, whenever it's there. And apart from that, there are also other areas outside of the signup flow where we do have parents' consent, as we were speaking about impact just a while ago. So when, as part of evaluating our impact, we do con conduct a lot of uh, parent-child play workshops where we do have video observational data. We have more detailed data on the children and how their development improves over time. So we have separate consent at that part in terms of how that data is never used um, outside of research and data deletion and all that policy around it. So those are two areas that I do want to highlight and also going back to what Moira just brought up first, the laws are still yet to come into place or are getting formed. So I feel like as an organization, we are borrowing from other laws like GDPR in other countries to see how we can model our practices based on what's followed in um, other countries at the moment. Yeah. Thank you, Sinducha. Would anyone else like to add to this topic? Okay, well then let's go to uh, another question we received. This one was uh, specifically directed at Fatima. Uh, and the question is, what efforts are you doing to uh, make the digital solutions accessible to everybody, uh, and especially in rural areas? Great question. Um, so basically, we work with a lot of NGOs. Um, so we partner up with them to reach the rural, co rural communities. You know, they already have a network around them, so it makes it much easier. So we, ha we have a lot of partnerships like that. In addition to that, we're also working with telcos, um, asking them that, listen, can you just make uh, accessibility even easier for people? So for example, um, maybe we would not want them to use too much data, right? Um, 
so by the way, just just I just realized one thing that I didn't mention um, is that we actually have a mobile app for Digital Nation Africa. So considering that Africa has around 650 million mobile users and it continues to grow, you know, we thought that um, uh, having a mobile app is uh, extremely essential to make this accessible for each and every one. So we made that mobile app and it's on Android because majority of the African uh, youth is on uh, Android. And what we have done is we have made a lot of the courses offline. So especially the introductory ones are, are also available offline. So what these NGOs do, they take that offline package and then they give it to their communities and their networks. Um, and even um, you know, if you're just accessing yourself, you can download the courses um, uh, completely offline and you can access them. So yeah, a lot of partnerships happening with everybody and just making sure that we reach um, as many people as possible. Yeah. Melissa, you're on mute. I, I think especially with, uh, you know, so many people offline across the continent, um, as well as, you know, uh, in rural areas, I think it's incredibly important to you know, make the solution available in an offline setting because we know that the digital divide is massive, you know, and in some in some countries it's even worse than others and there definitely is uh, an urban, you know, rural divide that um, challenges rural communities from gaining access to um, you know, skills, but one of the things that Fatima mentioned that I'm really excited about as well as when I run, you know, different coding camps or events where you know, we have students attending um, from the continent, you know, one of the biggest challenges is access to affordable data, you know, access to a device, you know, so I, I think there's incredible promise, you know, when it comes to how does, you know, IBM work together in a multi-stakeholder fashion with, um, you know, local government, you know, the IT ministries, the education ministries, but also the mobile operators so that, you know, we can kind of attack this digital divide, you know, together, you know, looking at the different, um, you know, elements that each of us play, whether that's, you know, formal education, you know, um, access to, you know, affordable internet or, you know, zero rate costs and that sort of thing. But that's a good question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for adding that. And I know that, for example, in Periel's discussion uh, or presentation, she also highlighted the role of working with uh, the local ministries. Uh, and so this collaboration across different sectors um, seems to be a, a common theme as well. I don't know if uh, Periel or Sinduja want to add anything to this question. Yeah, Maura, thank you, you Moira. Yeah, sorry, go ahead, Periel. Uh, I think it's really important to really have this uh, interaction with local ministries and uh, nationwide if you want to really be diffused in every single corner of the country. This is our case in, uh, with Wiskets uh, because um, Ministry of National Education actually gave us access to uh, very each, each corner of the country where rural areas are very underserved with you know, uh, at some other levels of services, but not education. And this mobile application, uh, WISKIT's mobile application was really powered by Ministry of National Education as well, in order to uh, support FOC, for example, free of charge data uh, spread for students to use uh, in the uh, mobile application for specifically in the mobile application. This was powered by also National Ministry of Education. So it's really important actually to have, uh, you know, by your side, uh, such an entity so that you can get actually spread and uh, join forces where you cannot uh, make any other, uh, you know, move. That's my ad. Yeah, and Sindusha, yeah. yeah, I know you had a, a audio problem. So just to repeat, the question was about uh, what you are doing to be inclusive, even in rural areas. Yeah, yeah. So I think one of the things that we've always been thinking, we're looking at when we design is what's the best possible medium to reach families, irrespective of where they are. And for us, what that means is it could be 
let's say using phone calls for people who just have an old button phone with them for people who have access to a smartphone we reach reach out to them with over whatsapp because that's something that they already use that's the first thing they use when they have a smartphone not many users use an app yet even though there is a growing number of online users and data access is increasing in india but even if we go to the other side of that spectrum where people might not even own a button phone even though the access for that is close to 80% plus at the moment so right we are partnering with the government organizations and um now at the moment designing some programs that can be broadcast on either radio or on television channels that are owned by the government um departments themselves so these are our efforts of how do we get our resources to more and more families even if they don't have access to a simple phone at the moment thank you for sharing that experience yeah so we we yes. hear a lot of different approaches and really looking at contextual situations what is best for the local situation and working with the key stakeholders so thank you all for sharing your uh inputs relating to that now um we only have a few minutes left so what i'd like to do is ask uh, all the speakers to take about half a minute uh, to just share their their final key observation or takeaway uh, and then i will wrap up with a few other resources and next steps so um and let's uh, just go uh in the opposite order so we'll start um with uh, the melissa and fatima with the ibm team please go ahead yeah i would just say that you know whether you're talking about india turkey or across the continent of africa we know that um digital skills are required for the future of, of work and for youth to be prepared to uh, achieve their dreams. These are some of the things that they need to have. And that means, you know, gaining access to affordable solutions or no cost solutions. And when I say affordable, I'm thinking about data specifically. We know that's a big challenge everywhere. So how can we make free offline safe solutions that enable our youth to be prepared for the future of work, whether that's in you know, Mozambique, Namibia, India, or um, you know, Turkey or anywhere else on the planet. And I'm excited to be working in a team at IBM that um, is investing in um, preparing youth for the future of work. And I look forward to continuing to do so, whether that's evangelizing for the DNA product um, or platform and or you know, getting uh, young people to join our IBMC Global Student Hub, which is another property we didn't talk about today. There's a lot of stuff that IBM has to offer. Um, you got a snippet into you know, kind of one of the exciting things going on and frankly, one of my favorites. Fatima, over to you. Oh, you're on mute, Fatima. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, but but to basically just uh, you know um, similar to what Melissa said, you know, education is a fundamental human right, you know, and I feel like it shouldn't have to be fancy and expensive and hard to uh, attain, you know. So just the fact that you know we all should work towards uh, making sure that um, education is accessible to everyone um, around the world. And nobody should have to, um, you know, suffer because they didn't get that opportunity. So yeah. All right. Thank you both for those words. And then Piril and finally Sinduja, please. So Piril, go ahead. Yes. Thank you very much. So um, the importance and uh, the necessity of continuous learning in today's digital world are obvious. The need for skills. Uh, emerged in the digital economy we're living in and not everyone is actually accessing this these kind of uh, education especially in mother tongue because the you know uh, education uh, content is usually in english and in turkey of course children are learning english as second language but still it's really important and vital for them to reach uh technology education in their mother tongue and satisfying these needs are very crucial for 
NGOs plus for private sector as well, because we have our own innovative processes and we need to actually create social innovative um, structures uh, which create a win-win uh, situation for the digital society as well as the sector. And um, supporting youth and ch children, uh, we, we really wanted to overcome the impossibilities and you know, create suitable educational opportunities for them. And data is very important at this level, especially when you create a mobile uh, solution, it's important also to create, to give first of all, some handsets that they can actually have, and then create data for that so that they can actually be online. So we are, as Turkcell, we are, of course, as, as being a telco company in Turkey, we are also working with NGOs and for free of charge methods to give all of the children uh, for WISKITS uh, to have some level of data, free data, so that they can actually be online and just learn these content, consume this content continuously. Of course, we, have, we are facing some challenges, but we are working with uh, these and we are trying to work with a Minister of National Education as well. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really important for either for Turkey or for Africa or for India, for everyone, every each one of us, it's really important actually to enable children to realize their potential no matter what. So we, we are here to do whatever we can with our own resources. Thank you. Yeah. So I think one of the things that all of all the other panelists brought up was access, universal access to quality education, right? So I think most organize, organizations working with underserved communities are working in the midst of a lot of constraints. And one of the things that how do we keep the quality high despite um, all these constraints around access, around um, like digital literacy and other issues that we, I mean, that we have, we, we that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So I, it, it is just all the more challenging to design for these contexts while also maintaining high quality fun and engaging education and life skill building. So I'm, I'm just very excited that I'm in the midst of other organizations and just got to experience some of the other programs that have been happening in different geographies and to just say, okay, we are not, we are not alone. There's a group of us and that that group is only going to keep increasing in number. So, yeah. Thank you. And I echo that. And, um, it's very important. And I think the fun side of it is important too, but of course, um, there's a lot of foundational issues that have to be addressed and that you have all spoken to very eloquently. And I'm very glad that you have raised um, awareness of those points because I think, uh, you know, every place has different conditions. Uh, and, you know, when one is not familiar with a specific region, one may not be aware of, those, of, of other challenges, things that are taken for granted in one place. Uh, will not be in another place. So uh, thank you again for highlighting all of that. So I want to wrap up now, though, because I know we're at the end, uh, just with a few um, encouragements for how to keep engaging. So first of all, please feel free to download the report. So the, the case studies from our presenters today are there, and there are also others covering a variety of other uh, applications and of other data-related um, uh, you know, considerations. So there, there are some great case studies there. So please do download it. Um, we also have an activity uh, that you can join that is looking to, to identify very specific projects that can be standardized or um, developed to help, again, spread the implementation of best practices in this space. Um, Feel free to contact me if you have any questions, want to hear more about any of these activities. Uh, and finally, we are also conducting another call for case studies uh, like these. Uh, the, the link is here, and we will also share that in our follow-up email. Um, following this, uh, within the next day or so, you should receive 
uh, uh, an email from us that also has a link to the recording of today's session. And um, some of these links you can find there as well. So we look forward to staying in touch with you, to engaging, uh, and to uh, hopefully, yeah, future opportunities to engage again. And please help us spread the word about uh, new case studies. Thank you, everybody. Thanks to the speakers and thanks to the attendees for your time. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye.